Good morning and welcome to worship on this 4th of July Sunday. It is great to see you all here at First Presbyterian Church in the sanctuary and worshiping online. So welcome. A few announcements before we get started this morning. Be sure to check this week's email newsletter for an update on Family Promise. The church will not be providing meals during our host week this month, but the restaurant and grocery store gift cards are greatly appreciated. So contact Susan Cottle if you would like to donate to that. Ministry team meetings this week include finance and personnel on Monday at 7. Worship and music has been moved to next Sunday because of the holiday. VBS is coming up July 11th through 14th. The theme is Knights of the North Castle. Volunteers are needed, so please contact Debbie Archer or Julie Parker. This week, as we continue in our series of children's books, our book is Leonardo the Terrible Monster by Mo Willems, and next week's book is A Terrible Thing Happened by Margaret Holmes. Now, a note about next week. Next week's scripture lesson is centered around trauma. So, as we prepare for the service, I encourage you to bring your favorite lovey, or as my kids call them, stuffy, stuffed animals, um, or blanket, and bring that with you to worship or gather that at home um, as part of our worship experience together for next week. Don't forget to continue to give your offering um, online that's available to you on Facebook and in the newsletter. And we have offering plates here in the sanctuary um, to continue to give gratitude to God through our tithes and offerings. Um, you have received an email, but we'd like to ask your continued prayers for Jack Brooks, his family, and the team of medical personnel. Um, we're hoping for potential surgery at some time uh, in Winston. So please continue to keep the, the family and him in uh, your prayers. And uh, Pastor Tom is staying in touch with the family and will update us um, and let us know anything else that we learn. They are grateful for your prayers. A reminder as we get started that today is Communion Sunday. If you are worshiping at home, please go ahead and gather your elements, knowing that what you have, God will bless for our time at the table. For those in the sanctuary, you will be allowed to remove your mask when you're invited to do so. And also, please remember that these two-part sets are a little bit tricky, so you'll need to open the top with the bread first and remove the wafer and then open um, the juice. And again, you will be invited to do that, at, do so at the proper time during the service. Let us continue to worship God through our call to worship this morning. Good morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. The prophet said the old spoke of God's justice, even when it was unwelcome. Who will hear their message? We will listen and we will hear. Responding to God's call, Jesus traveled, preaching and teaching to all who would listen. Who will hear his message? Christ sent out disciples two by two to spread the good news in any place that would welcome them. Who will hear their message? We will listen and we will hear. God's prophets are among us still, around the world, and in these pews. Who will hear their message? We will listen and we will hear. Let us pray together. God, you are a storyteller, and you made us in your image. You spoke, and you still speak, through unexpected people, through silence, through your word, written and proclaimed through the centuries. We come to hear your story once again, to find our place among your people and within your vision for all creation. We hear you call us to share your story in our words and in our actions, but we confess that more often our lips are sealed and we are afraid to tell your story. We think we don't know enough, 
and we are afraid of offending. We prefer to keep you to ourselves. Yet still your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Forgive us for letting the book gather dust on the shelf and the story gather dust in our hearts. Speak to us and through us, Lord. Help us to know you so well that we cannot help but love you and to love you so much we cannot help but serve you, sharing your good news in every place. For it is in doing your will that we find perfect freedom. We pray in the name of the one who is your living word, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Surely God is here reconciling us through the gift of grace. Surely, Christ is here, bringing the good news of our salvation. Surely, the Spirit is here, leading us to share this gift with others. Thanks be to God, who is always with us. As forgiven the children of God, let us now share the peace of Christ, with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. At this time, you are invited to stand, turn, wave, and greet one another with the peace of Christ from your location in the sanctuary. We ask that you remain where you are, but share a friendly offering of peace with others. For those joining us online, we extend Christ's peace to you and invite you to do the same. Good morning, please. You actually don't have to do anything, but just um, stand or be here. I am not a good reader with a mask on because I'm always sucking in my mouth. I'm like choking, so <gasps> hi. Um, would one of you please hold this in front of your face? And Anna, if you'll sit over here for just a minute, and I'll call you when it's time, okay? Um, I have enjoyed these uh, books so much this summer because, of course, this is a major part of my life, and to get to share it in another way, how wonderful. But our story today is Leonardo the Terrible by O. Willems, who, of course, did our artwork also. Hold it up in front of your face, please. Oh, okay. These girls, it's nothing like having something sprung on you last minute. And 
I didn't think of this till just right now, so sorry I didn't ask you beforehand to put you on the spot. Here we go. Leonardo was a terrible monster. Now, we all have our notions of what a monster should be. But he could not scare anyone. He didn't have 1,642 teeth. He wasn't big like Eleanor. He wasn't just plain weird like Hector. He was kind of simple and ordinary to be a monster. Leonardo tried very hard to be scary, but he just wasn't. One day, Leonardo had an idea. He would find the most scaredy cat kid in the world and scare the tuna salad out of him. So he did research until he found the perfect candidate, Anna. Come on up, Anna. And Anna actually should be Sam, but we changed it to Anna today. Leonardo snuck up on the poor, unsuspecting girl. And Leonardo let loose. Boo! Ah! And kept on and kept on until Anna started to cry. Yes, cheered Leonardo. I've done it. I finally scared the tuna salad out of someone. And then, Anna snapped. No, you didn't. Oh, yeah? Then why are you crying? My mean big sister took one of my toys while I was playing with it and broke it. And I don't have any friends, and my tummy is so upset. Oh. So Leonardo had a big decision to make and made a very big decision. Leonardo went to Anna and hugged Anna. That's how sweet. Instead of being a terrible monster, Leonardo would become a wonderful friend. But that didn't mean Leonardo didn't try to scare Anna sometimes. Boo! But you know what? It still didn't work. The end. So, we, Pastor Katie was talking um, in the verse, very beginning about Jesus being a carpenter. And, you know, people expected this man to be a royal king with the furs and the robes and not just plain clothing and not that crown of thorns that he eventually wore, just like people expected Leonardo to jump out of their skin if they saw a monster. But that's just not what it turned out to be. So Leonardo did make the right choice. Okay, let us pray. Dear Lord, help us to do the things that we know are right for ourselves and not be always what people think we ought to be or what we ought to be doing, but the things that work into our lives. And dear Lord, please help us to remember that in Jesus, you've got a friend.
as you taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for helping. Y'all good sport. Let us pray. Open to us your word and your way, holy God. Inspire us with your presence, quiet our distracted minds, and help us to focus on the message you intend for us today. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes to us from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. It's a familiar story. So let us hear what God has for us this day. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all of this? What's this wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. Jesus said to them, Prophets are honored everywhere except in their own hometowns, among their relatives and in their households. He was unable to do any miracles there except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was appalled by their disbelief. Then Jesus traveled through the surrounding villages teaching. He called for the twelve and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey except a walking stick. No bread, no bags, and no money in their belts. He told them to wear sandals, but not to put on two shirts. He said, whatever house you enter, remain there until you leave that place. If a place doesn't welcome you or listen to you as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a witness against them. So they went out and they proclaimed that people should change their hearts and lives. They cast out many demons and they anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As of this very moment, we are a mere 18 days and a handful of hours away from the opening ceremonies of the Tokyo Summer Olympics, which have been delayed a year, which means that we are 19 days away from the first event of swimming for these Olympic Games, which means that we are only 20 days away from the first 
medals being awarded in swimming in Tokyo. I'm a swimming nerd, y'all. Which means that if you need me, you'll have to pry me away from my television screen during those two weeks. The opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games also means the return of the Olympic theme music. You know which one I'm talking about, don't you? Don't you just feel like you could jump into any Olympic sport right now and win a medal? <laughs> or maybe three. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, and if you know classical music, you're about to have a really good laugh at me. But I thought that that theme song was something that the International Olympic Committee composed solely for use at the Olympics. I was wrong. The theme music is a piece by composer Aaron Copland entitled Fanfare for the Common Man, and it was composed in 1942 for the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. The piece was inspired in part by a speech made earlier that year by then American Vice President Harry A. Wallace, in which Wallace proclaimed the dawning of the century of the common man. The music has been recreated into alternative versions, and fragments of the work have appeared in many subsequent U.S. and British cultural productions, such as musical scores in movies and, of course, the Olympics. Now, Leonardo, our monster friend, is not going to be winning any Olympic medals at monstering anytime soon. Leonardo can't even make Sam, the most scaredy cat kid in the whole world, flinch in fear, even when he gives it all that he's got. Nothing. He is essentially a failure. After all, a monster's main job is to scare people, and he can't do it. In our gospel reading this week, Jesus arrives back in his hometown of Nazareth after a long stretch of fruitful ministry, We've heard that in the weeks preceding his return to Nazareth, he has secured the loyalty of 12 disciples. He has described God's kingdom with provocative parables. He has exercised demons. He has healed the sick, calmed a storm, and raised a little daughter from the dead. You could say he's a local hero. Or so we think until we arrive at this text from Mark's gospel in this week's story, Jesus enters the synagogue of his childhood and begins to teach in the tradition of the rabbis, and at first things go very well. His townspeople receive his words with astonishment and curiosity. Where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that he's been given? What about the powerful acts that have been accomplished through him? This is our Jesus. But then, almost without warning, something happens. Someone in the crowd starts thinking, this is our Jesus. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us, too? The local folks reject him. They turn away from him and his teachings, and they turn towards sin, the scripture tells us. Debbie Thomas writes this, quote, At this point, the text tells us the mood in the synagogue shifts. Appreciation morphs into accusation, curiosity becomes contempt, and the people take offense. They decide that Jesus is presuming too much, exceeding his bounds, not staying in his lane. End quote. Jesus astonishes the people with his teachings, and then they realize that he's doing things that he shouldn't be doing, things that they think that he should be doing. Leonardo should be scaring children. He should be making them want to run and hide and seek refuge with adults of comfort. That's what we assume monsters should be doing, right? Jesus should be following in 
his father's footsteps. He should be a carpenter. As the elder son, he should be economically supporting his mother, his younger brothers, and his sister. By preaching and teaching in the synagogues in this capacity, now remember, he is not a professional rabbi. He has financially abandoned his family. Jesus is not doing what a carpenter's son should be doing to care for his family. In their eyes, he's too concerned with other people to care for his own family, and that's shameful behavior. Jesus' choices have offended them, and they no longer have use for his teachings. So Jesus is rejected. Not for what he believes, but for who he is. And the rejection causes him to withdraw from the synagogue and from his hometown and send his disciples out to be the prophets in his stead. Listen to verse 5. He was unable to do any miracles there except that he had placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was appalled by their disbelief. Then Jesus traveled through the surrounding villages teaching in verse 7, he called for the twelve and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority. Their rejection literally blocked Jesus' work. We see in the miracles in Mark's gospel uh, that faith is necessary for healing. Reverend Eric Fistler notes, quote, Just last week, Jairus, Jairus sorry, Jairus, and the hemorrhaging woman each had faith before being healed, and Jesus called upon that faith as the reason for their healing. End quote. Their lack of faith blocked them from participation in the kingdom of God. Their rejection makes the healings and the uniting power of the new kingdom inaccessible to them. Leonardo has a big decision to make. He could attempt to become the scary monster that he was supposed to be, or he could become a wonderful friend to Sam and everyone else. He chose the latter. Instead of being a scary monster, Leonardo became a friendly one. He comforted Sam when his friend was upset, and then they played together. Jesus moved on. He sent his disciples, gave them authority, and instructed them in how they should behave should they, too, face the same rejection. Both Leonardo and Jesus had choices to make. They could conform to what others wanted, or they could be who they knew deep down that they are. Neither of them were made or called uh, to be who society said that they should be. Jesus said to them, prophets are honored everywhere except in their own hometowns, among their relatives, and in their own households. In her commentary, Debbie Thomas warns against the tendency to reject the prophet, saying, in some mysterious and disturbing way, the people's small-mindedness, their lack of trust, and their inability to embrace a new facet of Jesus' life and mission keeps them in spiritual poverty. Notice that their lack of faith isn't a mere technicality. It has real and lamentable consequences. It constrains Jesus. End quote. In sending out his disciples, Jesus instructs them and therefore us on hospitality. Through their being sent out, Jesus teaches that we must be opened to listening to and meeting the needs of those who aren't like us. They will come to us with needs to be met, but they also have something to teach us, and we need to listen. Reverend Rob McCoy shared the story of a former congregation's mission team who had absolutely no problem providing and preparing a meal for the people in town who were experiencing homelessness. The issue they had was encouraging those same people to sit down and eat that meal with the very people that they were feeding. As I have lived with these texts this week, I couldn't help but think about them with consideration of Immigration Sunday. Today is the Sunday in the life of our denomination that we recognize and celebrate the immigrant. 
I think about how Jesus was rejected by his own people, so he sent out his disciples to do the work that he was blocked from doing at home. And I think about the immigrant who presents themselves at the border seeking a life that they are blocked from having at home. How, are they, how they are often rejected and even despised for who they are. And I think about Aaron Copeland who composed such a beautiful piece an American-born son of Lithuanian immigrants. I think of his contribution to the musical world through all of these patriotic and Americana-themed musical pieces, and how he was questioned by Joseph McCarthy as part of the Red Scare in the 1950s. And I think about Jesus, how in all of his rejection, he took the path of no hostility, he taught his disciples to simply leave, as he did, and wipe the dust from their feet as they go. He continued to care for, in the ways that he could, the people in his hometown who needed him. He ate at the table with the very people who would betray him. I wonder what the kingdom of God would look like had Jesus chosen to retaliate when he was scorned. I think of how life-changing it is for people like Leonardo and Sam, you know, their human counterparts, to embrace friendship over inciting terror. I think of the amazing music that celebrates the everyday person that we would be missing without Aaron Copeland. I think about how much less playful my neighborhood would be without the children of the families who have immigrated to our country who run and squeal and play. I think about the table where we will gather shortly and how Jesus could have said no, but instead served even the most sinful of us all. On this 4th of July, as we celebrate the freedoms that we have been given, let us remember first and foremost the grace and the freedoms that we have received and that we continue to receive from a God who was an immigrant, a refugee, a reject, and yet who loves us still. As we prepare to go to the table of the Lord today, I want to close with the Immigrant's Creed. It's a profession of Christian faith written through the experience of an immigrant, and it comes to us from the Book of Common Worship. Let us hear these words. I believe in Almighty God who guided the people in exile and in Exodus, the God of Joseph in Egypt and Daniel in Babylon, the God of foreigners and immigrants. I believe in Jesus Christ, a displaced Galilean, who was born away from his people and his home, who fled his country with his parents when his life was in danger, and returning to his own country, suffered the oppression of the tyrant Pont Pontius Pilate, the servant of a foreign power, who then was persecuted, beaten, and finally tortured, accused, and condemned to death unjustly. But on the third day, this scorned Jesus rose from the dead, not as a foreigner, but to offer us citizenship in heaven. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the eternal immigrant from God's kingdom among us, who speaks all languages, lives in all countries, and reunites all races. I believe that the church is the secure home for the foreigner and for all believers who constitute it, who speak in the same language and have the same purpose. I believe that the communion of the saints begins when we accept the diversity of the saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sin, which makes us all equal, and in reconciliation, which identifies us more than does race, language, or nationality. I believe that in the resurrection, God will unite us as one people in which all are distinct and all are alike at the same time. Beyond this world, I believe in life eternal in which no one will be an immigrant, but all will be citizens of God's kingdom, which will never end. Amen. Amen. As citizens of God's kingdom, 
Let us join together in offering our prayers, our hopes, our dreams, our faults to the one who loves us still. Let us pray. Gracious God, because we are not strong enough to pray as we should, you provide Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to intercede when we go astray. In this confidence, we pause as a people to lift our prayers of thanksgiving, intercession, lamentation, and petition. We ask that you accept the prayers we make that serve your will and fulfill the vision you have for the world. God of mercy, hear our prayers. As we give thanks for the freedoms we enjoy on this Independence Day, we pray for peoples and countries struggling under oppressive regimes, abusive systems of power and coercive means of control. We pray for our nation's leaders who seek creative ways to address complex problems. We pray for the safety and well-being of our military personnel, especially those serving in harm's way. We pray for those who are traveling this weekend, that they might be responsible and safe. We pray for those in our nation still waiting to be freed from hunger, poverty, and the ravages of injustice. We pray for those seeking refuge in our nation. God of mercy, hear our prayers. Compassionate God, as we continue to move through this pandemic, we pray for health and healing. Lift up the depressed, befriend those who grieve, comfort the anxious, fill all people with your Holy Spirit, that we might bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. God of mercy, hear our prayers. United as a family of faith and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. is not my table. This is not First Presbyterian Church's table. This is not our denomination's table or an American table or a table reserved for the wealthy or well-connected. This table is reserved for sinners, for the poor, for those who are cast out, for those who hunger and thirst. 
This table is reserved for all seeking to know God. This table belongs to Jesus Christ. Friends, all are invited to this table, and I am here to announce to you that whatever you think disqualifies you from God's love has been washed away in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I announce to you that the table is ready for you, for me, for everyone. Come. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And we pray, blessed are you, O Lord our God, creator of the universe. For you made all things and called them good. Earth, sea, and sky are yours. Every tree and bird, every seed sprouting, every firefly twinkling, and every drop of precious water is witness to your grace. We give you thanks this day for generosity, for you are the giver of every good gift. Today, we especially give you thanks for the gift of freedom, for those who have worked and sacrificed to honor that gift, and for the many privileges we enjoy in this place. We thank you for the gift of this community, the gift of curious minds and ingenuity, the privilege of learning and teaching. We thank you for your son who became flesh and lived among us in order that we might know the gift of your abundant life right here in these bodies, right here in this body. When we forget all that we have from every tiny bone to every big cathedral, that it's a gift from you, call us back to your truth. When we are tempted by the siren song of individual independence, remind us that we are but part of your body on earth. When we separate this earth from your spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear your breath in every heartbeat, every gust of wind, every creaking joint, every neighbor's laugh and enemy's tear. We hold in your light those who live in fear, in violence, under oppression. We remember your people. As we gather at this table, we remember that many are hungry. As we share the cup together, we remember that many are thirsty. May the day come soon when there may be food and water for all. May the day come soon when justice and peace take the place of violence. May the day come soon when your freedom may be known by all of creation. Many grains come together to make bread, and yet our world community is fractured. As we eat this feast, draw us together in your spirit. Make us again into your body, loving, serving, and caring for the world. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered at the table with his closest friends. He chose to share a meal with even those that would reject him. And after the meal, he took the bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he blessed it and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take 
and eat. And in the same way, he took the cup and gave, he gave thanks to God for it and he poured it out and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed for you and my blood, sealed. This is for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it. As often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do proclaim Christ's saving death until he comes again. This is the feast of Christ for everyone. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. At this time, you are invited to remove your mask and partake in the elements of communion. Carefully unwrap your wafer and eat it before opening your juice. And after you have consumed this holy meal, please return your masks to your face. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. join together in prayer. God of grace, you have given us all things, and you have fed us with Christ's presence through this sacrament. We commit ourselves to you now, and we give ourselves to the work of your kingdom, which is upon us in Jesus' life. Thanks be to God. Amen. that we have in abundance so that by always having enough of everything we may share abundantly in every good work let us pray together to dedicate our offerings to God this morning collaborative creator God you call us to join in your work of love in the world and you equip us with all we need to follow your lead now make us generous of hand heart and mind as generous as you are. As we return to you a portion of your gifts, we pray you would receive them as a sign of our gratitude for your unending love and guide us as we offer our whole selves in your service, seeking your abundant life for all. Amen. Children of God, receive now this benediction. Go now. And wherever people will hear you proclaim the life-changing love of God, do not fear your weakness. For when you are weakest, Christ's strength is known. Travel lightly, live simply, and honor those who welcome the gospel. And may God be your protection and safe haven. May the power of Christ dwell in you, and may the Holy Spirit be your guide forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord this day and every day. Amen.